My name is Nick Rogers. I'm a geotechnical specialist with Tonkin and Taylor. Uh, we're consulting engineers, and uh, I have today with me Doug Johnson, who's the managing director of Tonkin and Taylor. And I have Mike Jacker, senior geotechnical engineer from the Christchurch office here, who's been on the ground since day one, September the 4th. We also have um, Kelvin Berryman, of the head of the Natural Pla Hazards, Pla Hazards Platform. Kelvin, somewhere? Oh, okay. Hi, Kelvin. And uh, we also are double teaming this, so we have Sean Van Balagoy, Kate Williams and Chris Bould of Tonkin and Taylor actually briefing the elected representatives upstairs at the moment as well. And I guess what you don't see is we've got uh, coordinators in the Dean's Ave office, which is Amy McDonald and Seamus Wallace, who are coordinating 270 engineers from throughout New Zealand who have been doing the the hard yards actually doing the, the mapping on the ground, and of course they're still out in the field uh, mapping as we speak. I think it's important to realise just what uh, a huge team has actually been working on the engineering and scientific work in terms of informing government, in terms of the uh, information they need so that they can make decisions for the recovery going forward. The Earthquake Commission, I guess we don't need to say too much about them, there's been so much in the press lately, but uh, they just have an enormous team actually out in the field, some 900 people working on the claims assessment process. And of course now we have the Canterbury Earthquake Recovery Authority themselves with uh, Roger Sutton and, uh, and the big team that he's getting uh, underneath uh, himself as well. But certainly GNS Science as well as the Natural Hazards Platform, they have their own very large teams and right at the start of this event, um, Kelvin Berryman actually set up a lot of sub-projects under the Natural Hazards Platform to inform government specially. So he's got some 29 projects which have been informing um, what's happening to the science and the seismology around, uh, around Canterbury. The councils, again, have very large teams of people who have been informing, um, particularly about the infrastructure damage. And then we have the insurance industry with all the private insurers with their teams, with their project management teams and their their assessors. We have LINS. Now they're responsible for all aspects of land information, but particularly the survey network. So they've been looking at what's been happening to the benchmarks around Canterbury, because they've been moving. And NIWA, of course, with their expertise, they've been looking at uh, what's happening offshore in terms of in terms of faults and, uh, and what information they can glean with their, their offshore seismic uh, mapping. New Zealand Aerial Mapping have been doing not only the aerial photography so that we can see what's happened over large areas quite quickly, but they've also been running the LIDAR surveys, which have all been so informing us about the, uh, the land deformation, what the land levels have been doing, because I think we've all, be, all been realising that the land has been going down in some areas more than others. Christchurch Gen Engineering Consultants, again, they've been very active in informing basically uh, government in terms of what they know and what information they have available and their expertise. And those are all other consultants throughout New Zealand, not just the, uh, the Christchurch ones. We've also had teams of international researchers coming in because the liquefaction damage that we're seeing in Canterbury is unprecedented on a world scale. So this is very much of interest to the world and they've been coming here and sharing their expertise with us so that we can inform government on what's happening. Of course, what we now know is that the earthquake on 4th of September last year was the start of an earthquake sequence. So we're now calling it really the Canterbury earthquake sequence that started that day and continues as we speak. Those of you who went out saw the major fault rupture where we had uh, more than four metres of lateral displacement across roads. And what we have here is that because it was some distance from Christchurch, the felt intensities weren't that high in Christchurch itself. So very large earthquake, very large um, um, accelerations, but once we get uh, into Christchurch itself, they tend to taper off. And then February the 22nd occurred, and really that changed everything, as the Minister said. We were well on track to basically recovering from the Darfield earthquake when basically the Christchurch earthquake struck. So it wasn't just two steps forward and one step back, it was more like one step forward and ten steps back. And these slides here show really why 
the February 22nd earthquake caused so much damage, although it was a, a lower magnitude. If you look at the intensities, if you look at the image on the left, you can see the intensity scale actually decreasing so that Christchurch is in the yellow, which is basically largely, in this case, MM6. Whereas the February 22nd earthquake, you see all the red centred right on Christchurch. It was virtually a bullseye. It was a direct hit on Christchurch. If we look at the comparison, we can also see why the February 22nd earthquake was so destructive. We look at the ground accelerations, you've got the vertical accelerations on the top, horizontal on the bottom, and you can see the magenta colour, which was the 4th of September uh, earthquake, and you look at the blue, which is the 22nd of February. You've got vertical accelerations above 2G from the 22nd of February event, and horizontal accelerations approaching 2G. If we look at where those accelerations sort of sit in terms of some of the earthquakes we're familiar with, we can see that the 2011 February earthquake, very high acceleration, some of the highest accelerations actually been recorded anywhere in the world. And in fact, the 13th of June, we had around 2G horizontal and 1G vertical in the Port Hills. So that would rank basically as a second um, tier earthquake, if you like, in comparison with Kobe, Haiti and, uh, and California. I guess we're all familiar with the images, and I'll just skip through these, but I guess it's just to make it clear just the extent of the, of the land damage. Liquefaction, what comes to the surface isn't liquefaction. Liquefaction is the process. We just get silt, sand and water. That's what we're actually seeing on the surface. Huge amounts of water, sand and silt ejected. And of course, what gets ejected up above the ground surface means that the ground has to have gone down by a similar amount. So every time you get that material on the ground surface, Basically, you know that the ground itself must have gone down. Also, where the ground can move laterally, it does, and you've got major fissures and cracks throughout Canterbury now as a result of what we call lateral spreading. Of course, where we get both sides of a river spreading in, any structure that's built across that uh, structure tends to act like a prop and it gets squeezed, and we see the dramatic images uh, of basically bridges getting squashed. What we also see, of course, if you get both sides of the river squashing in, you get the power lines. You can see here the power lines are draping pretty close to the, the river. Again, the ground hasn't gone down here. Structures which basically uh, contain either water or air will want to float, and so the manholes pop up. Pump stations pop up. I haven't seen one swimming pool yet that hasn't popped up throughout Canterbury. And of course, what we also see is that where the ground loses its capacity to support our structures, things drop down. So power poles, ladder boxes, these things are often much shorter than they were. Things just don't look the same anymore when you go around the suburbs. If you draw a line across this, everything's wonky. Nothing basically is, is true in a lot of these suburbs anymore. It's quite hard often to get to your reference points though. Until you walk around houses like this, in fact, you can actually reach up and get your tennis balls out of the gutter. QE2 Park. Again, just an example of moderate liquefaction from the air, right through to severe liquefaction. We had quite a lot of severe liquefaction, in fact, which was fairly localised after the Darfield earthquake, but what we saw after the 22nd of February earthquake this year was just massive severe liquefaction. We didn't have the burial of cars the first time around, but we certainly have seen that subsequent to that. Again, just the massive amount of water actually ejected 